Thank you, Anthony. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God for all of us, and the communion of the Holy Spirit that brings us all together. Not on? Oh, hold on. We can start over. <laughs> I got two different mics in my pocket, and I've got an ice pack on that starts melting. All these wires, I could go up in a bright flame. How about that? There, okay. Let's start over then. This is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit that knits us all together, whether here in person, joining us via Zoom, or later through FCAT, we come together as God's people. Um, I just want to let you know that two weeks ago, we went to the Woo Sox game, and as I mentioned, it was just like Noah rain. It was cold, it was wet. I had to borrow a friend's sweatshirt because I was so cold and unprepared. Last Sunday, we went off to a family wedding up in the White Mountains, and on Friday night, it was clear, but it was actually absolutely cold. And again, unprepared Randy, I had to ask another relative so if I could borrow a sweatshirt, it was that cold. And then on the day of the wedding, I don't know if I've told you before, I know some people know, uh, if I plan something outdoors, um, God just laughs. And so Friday was a beautiful, clear day. Sunday was a beautiful, clear day. We have a late afternoon Saturday wedding, and it is just pouring. And this poor bride, you know, they, they plan for so long, and she's up in some kind of, I don't know, other area where she's getting all dressed with her bridesmaids. She has to come down this gravel uh, little sidewalk to the tent where we were, and it's just pouring on this beautiful girl. I felt so bad, but I was there, and it's always going to rain if I'm outside. And so the next day was Sunday, and it was beautiful again, and I went to the, uh, the North Conway Congregational Church uh, to worship there as you were holding your worship here, and it was, it was air-conditioned in that church. And so uh, just to let you know, I got that ice pack on, so it's not too bad here. Um, but we're going to move this right along today because I give you people credit. You do not have to be here in person today, especially when we have Zoom. Uh, but you are still, you count this important enough to be here on a miserable Sunday like this where it's hot and humid. And so we will move these things along. But thank you for being with us as we begin our worship. So with all of that said, um, if you are able, I invite you to please stand for our opening hymn and candle lighting, which is This is the Day, Blue Hymnal number 652. <laughs> turn to our bulletins for the call to worship. Great is our God and greatly to be praised. Worship the one whose grace covers us all with holiness ready for heaven. Let us ponder God's steadfast love for all creation. Let us tear down the barriers that would leave some beyond God's love. We gather to celebrate the abundance of God's love and to become better equipped to share it with others, whoever they are. 
And now coming together for our unison prayer here in person, those on Zoom and later through FCAT, let us pray. Jesus, you are with us in ways so ordinary that they may pass unobserved, and with us in ways so extraordinary that we may not be able to grasp their reality. We call upon your name in our worship, asking that you be our faithful guide, that you alert us to all that is holy and close at hand, and that you be our sure defense against temptations and distractions that try to cover the miraculous in our world. Fill us with awe at the promise of heaven. Give us strength to bring heavenly ways into our earthly days. When you return to your old hometown, your neighbors took offense at you. Let us never allow the common experience of word and communion to block the amazing truth that they share your sacred presence. Come, Spirit of Truth, to open our hearts, minds, and souls during this sacred hour. Amen. Corinthians chapter 12 verses 2 through 10. It's a rather awkward reading so I'll do my best here. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weaknesses. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Would our celebrity like to come forward? She's got so many jobs. She lights candles, she says hello, Sunday school. But to tell you the truth, I think she has to endure me. <laughs> come on, Sakura. There you go. How are you? How are you? Did you see any fun? What's this? That's a putty cat? Very cute. Very, I like the bow tie. The it's ribbon. Not, yeah. No, it's pawing. It, it's, and it's his paw? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now it's paw. Help me. <laughs> what? It's his paw. It's his paw? Uh -huh. Okay. I like that. Do you, want, do you want him? Oh, and it makes sounds too. Okay. Do you want to sit up here? 
Would you like to come on up too? Just okay. I think she feels a lot more comfortable. Can you sit with you? I'll come sit. Let's sit there. The did you get to see any fireworks? Yeah. Did you? Were they fun or did they scare you? Oh, oh, that must have been fun, huh? That was a burrito. Oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. So that was all celebrating the birth. That, that makes you happy? Well, that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Do you know that was celebrating our country's birthday? Yeah, we're 248 years old, which is a little bit older than me. <laughs> you make paper airplanes in church, too? Okay. That would do. Yep. All right, you're gonna make a paper airplane out of that? Okay, that yellow map. I don't know what I'm gonna do here. Because <laughs> Sam, Sam was here last Sunday and she made a paper airplane. Oh, oh, so Sam did this? Thank you, Reverend Sam. <laughs> so now you know every minister yeah. can make a paper airplane. Okay, all right, let's see if mine or Reverend Sam's flew better. Let's see. Okay, did she, did she fly hers? Do you know, Sakura, when my girls were small, my father used to come to church and sit with them, and he used to make airplanes. And my daughter is now 30 years old, and every time she comes to church, she still makes an airplane to remember her grandpa. Okay, you ready? Hold on. Hold my hold. This is it, by the way. There's nothing. All right, here we go. You ready, Sakura? You're going to see if you can catch it? Okay. You're going to fly all the way over here? Oh, wow. Oh. Good job, Randy. All right, amen. We're done. Well, you have a wonderful time. Oh, that was even better. You have a wonderful time in Sunday school, okay? All right. So she asked me to make a boat. A that. boat? And I was like, mm, I'm not that good. I could maybe make an airplane, but okay. not a boat. Okay. All right. Upstairs, we'll fly it. Okay. Bye-bye. I was going I was going to talk about Emancipation Day, which is the state holiday tomorrow. And just to briefly mention, um, we were the first state in the colonies that outlawed um, slavery. And that happened when a guy named uh, Quack Walker sued his owner, and the state said, yeah, our Constitution says, and the, and, and the Declaration of Independence says, all men are created equal, and so they actually said, you can't own other people. And so tomorrow is Emancipation Day in Massachusetts only, because we were the first state to outlaw slavery, and I think we should be proud of that. So that's tomorrow. All right, um, let's see where we are. All right, it looks like our special music is Waltz in A-flat major by Brahms.
again, Anthony. Now time for us to share our joys, our celebrations, and our concerns. And um, I would like to uh, mention before uh, the usual intentions I have and then hitting the yellow sheet, um, I think many of us know Frank Marchand. Some of us may even have gone over to the Shea and seen his one-man play uh, that he did about his uh, continuing battle with cancer. Well, he called me yesterday, and I asked if it would be all right to share, and he said yes. Um, the, uh, the treatments have run their course, and there's nothing else that uh, can be done. And so there are some things that they could try, a um, little minimal chance of them succeeding, and quality of life would really drop. And so Frank has decided to, um, you know, he's still going to fight, as he always has for nine years, um, but the doctors told him that he probably has six months to live. Um, so Frank is, is uh, a, a, a good man, a hard-working man. He's Frank Marchand Plumbing. You probably see his truck driving around. Um, and so we keep Frank in our prayers. He, he really has dealt with cancer amazingly strongly. And so we keep him in our prayers uh, so that, you know, there's always miracles. And we, we do pray that, that Frank, uh, you know, can, can live longer than six months and live well, because I know the living well is important to him. Uh, so when we say Frank M. on here, uh, he, he wants us to know what's going on. Um, so just let's keep him in our prayers, our special prayers, um, as he goes through these extra special times. Also, um, let's continue to offer our prayers uh, for the nation of Ukraine as that war continues there, and also for that war that is between Israel and Hamas, and terrified that it may spread to Hezbollah as well in Lebanon. So uh, prayers for peace in the Middle East. Also, prayers for people in this heat. You know, uh, we don't realize, I don't think too often, but more people die from the natural cause of heat than any other uh, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, whatever. Heat will kill more Americans or more people in the world than any other natural disaster. And as uh, this month of July just adds up with this heat and humidity, uh, let's keep all the people in, in our prayers that are suffering through this heat and maybe don't have a place of relief from the heat. Uh, so let's keep them in our prayers um, at this special hot month of the year. And we also continue to pray for our nation as we face the reality and persistence of institutional racism. So before we hit the yellow sheet, does anybody have any joys or celebrations, concerns you'd like to share? Yes. Angie M. Okay. But thank you for sharing. Yeah, Teresa. My Twenty-one. Holy mackerel. Wow. She was yay tall. Now <laughs> twenty-one. Wow. Okay. Well, congratulations, Grandma. That's wonderful. Any other joy, celebrations, concerns? All right. Let us turn to our yellow sheet and remember we're just saying the first names. So let us offer prayers for. Alan, Alice, Amy and Tom, Antonia and family, Angie, Art, Bill, Bill, Bonnie, Chris and family, Cheryl, Cindy, Edna, Frank, Grayson, Jeff, Jim, John, John, Kathy, Leslie, Liz, Lynn, Marcia, Mary Jane and Joe, Michelle, Mike, Pauline, Richard, Sandra, Sandra and John, Steve, Stephen, Virginia and Richard, Wink, victims of violence and natural disasters anywhere in the world, and we pray for peace on earth. And may we now turn inward for just a few moments in the middle of our public worship to offer God those prayers that we just choose not to say out loud. So just a few moments of silence. Mighty God and perfect teacher, help us to grow closer to you by living more closely to the example set for us by Jesus of Nazareth. May your word constantly astound us. May the gift of communion strengthen us always. Help us to see with eyes of faith so that the world seems less threatening than it is. Emancipate us from the bonds of sin and prejudice. Share Christ's lived example with us so that we may see in each other the spark of the divine. And let us know that our prayers, they are heard, that they do matter, and that they will be answered as you alone know best, 
And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And may we now join together in sharing in the words that Jesus gave to all of us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Many in the world expect to receive, and they actually resent it when they are asked to give. Jesus turned these priorities completely around giving thanks for the opportunities to share what he had with all others. And we are benefactors of Christ's generosity. We are blessed constantly by God in our lives. So in gratitude, let us bring our offerings to the church and also through the church to Christ. Therefore, may our contributions be as generous as our faith expects and as our conditions allow, and they will be accepted now in person, or if you join us via Zoom or FCAT, they can always be mailed here to the church. However you choose to give, if you are able, it is appreciated. Accept, O Lord, these offerings now to be placed here in your sanctuary as a symbol of our love for you and for all others. On a hot and muggy day like today, you do not have to be here. We don't preach a fearful God that says if you don't come here, you're going to burn in hell. You are here because you choose to be here. And for that, we give you thanks that your heart is in the right place, your soul is close to God, and that this place is important to you. So for all that you do that makes this place important and all that you do to support this place through your work and through these offerings, we thank you because whether a lot of other people realize it or not, this place is a gift and a blessing. 
So thank you for all that you do, and may God continue to bless you and these offerings to his purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And today's gospel is taken from Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. And Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, Jesus began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. And they said, where did this man get all of this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, though, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us, too? And they took offense at Jesus. And then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was, and he was amazed at their unbelief. And then Jesus went about among the villages teaching. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. And he ordered them to take nothing on their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, and they were to only wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. And so they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. So back on June 17th, the Celtics won a lead record 18th NBA title. Yeah, ooh, and, and that is kind of cool because we have the most of any team, and what makes it even more special is the L.A. Lakers only have 17, so we're better than the L.A. Lakers. Now, the problem was is that this team, the last time they won was in 2008, so that's 16 years ago, and I'm not, I'm a fair weather fan, and so, like, if they do well, I get on the bandwagon, I get all excited. If they don't do so well, I don't. Like we were talking about, I was all excited Friday when the Red Sox won in the 10th inning. They came back in the 9th, they won in the 10th. I was all Red Sox, Red Sox, and then yesterday, 14 to 4, I'm off the bandwagon again. So I'm a fair weather fan. But these guys, who, who, there are people who know a lot more about basketball than I do. And they kept saying, after this, this span of 16 years since their last championship, they're saying maybe this team, maybe they're just not good enough to take it all. Maybe these players just don't come together as a team and play well enough together as a team to win it all. But they did. And the amazing thing is, is that after they won, you still had the naysayers and stuff like that, but they had their, you know, they had their duck boat parade and all of that. They had the championship. And, and then what the Boston Globe does is after that, they run a special section in the paper, in the Sunday paper, and, and they celebrate the team. And so the centerfold of that whole brand new section on the Celtics um, had this guy, uh, Jason Tatum. Okay, he takes up a whole page of the centerfold of this special section of the Boston Globe. And this is what um, is on the other side of the centerfold. So I, I'll read it here, and then you can keep looking at Jason Tatum, because this is what is on the other side of the Boston Globe centerfold for their celebratory uh, winning of the NBA title. They said plenty that you, this guy here, Jason Tatum, that you don't have what it takes, that you're not it, that you can't lead, that you can't close a game, that you don't show up. They wrote you off far too early. They said, you can't win it all. And now that you have, maybe they'll stop talking. But then again, maybe it's best that they don't. And then in deep, dark red letters with a black background, it's got don't stop disbelieving. You know, in church, we always talk about don't stop believing. You know, believing is, is what's at our core. So that message of don't stop disbelieving, that should kind of ring in a special way for us. It should sound unfamiliar and strange. And when it does, hopefully it sinks in. Don't stop disbelieving. So keep that in mind when you go back to that gospel story about Jesus going back to his hometown of Nazareth. 
So Jesus is just at the early stages of his ministry. And, you know, rumors are starting to get back to Jesus, or back to Jesus' hometown. And up in that hometown, when he was there last, he was just the carpenter. He was an ordinary neighbor. You know, he was just the guy down the street. If, you know, had a broken window, broken door, call Jesus. That was Jesus. There were no parables. There were no miracles. There were no disciples. Jesus was just Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter. And then, since it's a small village, everybody knows that something goes strange with Jesus. And he takes off. Nobody leaves these little villages. And Jesus leaves. He goes all the way through Samaria. He goes down into Judea, and then he goes out into the wilderness, and they all know he's going out there to see this John the Baptist guy who has got a reputation as being strange. This guy's a little bit different. And Jesus went to him. And so if you're in a small town, we're in a small town, you know how rumors spread. So they're all talking about Jesus and Jesus and Jesus. And now he comes home. And as Jesus comes home for this first time since leaving as the carpenter, he comes home and he goes to the synagogue. Now, you know, in these small little villages, it's probably that they cannot afford, all these small little villages cannot afford to have their own professional rabbi. And so people would stand up from the community and they would offer words to say. And you know, in the, in the ancient Middle East, uh, holy places would be built on top of holy places so that, um, say even you were conquered and maybe a, a foreign religion came in there was still something about place that was sacred. And so they would build their temple, their worship site, on top of a previous worship site. And so archaeologists can dig down, and they actually know where the Nazareth synagogue was from this first century AD where Jesus would have been. And so they know that there were stone benches around the perimeter of this like rectangular room. And I don't travel well. I really don't. I'm already getting nervous about my trip to Europe in a few weeks. I'm getting nervous about it because I don't travel well. But if I could travel better, you know, I ever went to the Holy Land, I wouldn't go looking for like Jesus' crib where he was born. Nobody knows where Jesus' crib was. I wouldn't go looking for shards of the cross. Nobody knows where the shards of the cross are. But they know where Jesus sat, and they know where Jesus taught as Jesus was becoming the Jesus we know. And I would love to be able to go to that synagogue and be where Jesus once was. But he's there 2,000 years ago. And he stands up, as would be the custom, as he maybe have done before as the carpenter. And he stands up, but now there's something different about him. In people, the word in the Bible is is they're astounded. Jesus astounds them. And so it was what he said, probably also the way he said it. There must have been some kind of a feeling that was different than what he said before as just the carpenter. And so they're all wondering, where did he get this wisdom? Where did he get this power? What happened? And they're astounded. And then just like that, the tenor of the whole story changes. They're astounded. And then all of a sudden, it says they take offense at Jesus. Why? It's not what he says. They can feel the power of what he says. They can feel the word of God in them speaking to them. But there's something that bothers them. It's that he's the carpenter. They could not get past the fact of who Jesus once was. And because they couldn't get past the fact of who Jesus once was, they blocked out all of that astounding astonishment of who he is now. And so they tuned out Jesus because of who he once was. And because of who he once was, they missed their chance to, become, to be able to see Jesus as more than the carpenter. And it says in the Bible, it says they were astounded at Jesus. It says he was amazed at their disbelief. Jesus could not understand how they could disbelieve. And it says that a prophet is not without respect in his hometown and in his own house. Even his family. They list the family members. There are brother James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, his mother Mary. And it doesn't bother to list the names of the sisters. They're there, but 2,000 years ago, women didn't matter as much. And so there's no names of the sisters, but they're there. And it says not even in his own house was Jesus respected because they could only remember what he was not who he is. They judged him by what he was instead of what he said. And so Jesus left that town. He never, ever came back. That was their last chance. And you know, we always hope that there's another chance. Like if we miss a chance of faith, we always hope there's another chance coming down the road. But each and every one of us, there is going to be a last chance. For the people of Nazareth, this was their last chance. Jesus left his hometown and never, ever came home again. So with all of those people, his old neighbors disbelieving, with his family 
In his own house, it says, disbelieving. Jesus has to, don't stop disbelieving. He has to disbelieve all of the things that they're thinking about him, that this cannot be the Messiah because we know who he was. Jesus has to disbelieve everything that those people around him in Nazareth that knew him for 30 years were believing about him. Jesus had to disbelieve it all, and he does. Because the next passage says that as Jesus leaves there, not only does he continue to preach, but he takes his 12 disciples, he, he puts them into uh, six different pairs of two, and he sends them out. And now, not only is his work you know, spreading the gospel, now it's time six. All these pairs of disciples are going out in every direction, and they're going out, and these fishermen, these, these tax collectors, these ordinary people, they are beginning to preach like Jesus preached, and it even says they're doing miracles like Jesus was doing miracles. And so how in the world did a fisherman or a tax collector or somebody else ever have the confidence to go out and do these things? Because everybody would have said, you can't. And so they had to have this don't stop disbelieving. They had to have the courage to think beyond what other people thought about them, to think beyond who people thought they once were. They had to have the confidence and the faith to believe in themselves. And guess what? We're now the disciples. We're the ones who have to disbelieve what's going on in the world. I went yesterday. I, I couldn't go with Sharon because Sharon uh, tested positive for COVID. I tested negative this morning, but she's home with COVID. We were supposed to go to Williamstown Theater Festival, so I batched it yesterday and went by myself uh, to see, I think her name is Rachel Bloom. And a lot of people were really enjoying it. I did not. It was not fun for me. Uh, there's two ladies sitting next to me. Um, they started off as they sat down and and uh, one had just broken up, I think, with a boyfriend, and she's crying. The other one's got her hand around her, consoling her about breaking up with her boyfriend. Then there's, there's empty Sharon seat, so I'm crying. And then over here, there's another seat, and this woman is having such a good time during the concert that she's laughing out loud, like my mother used to laugh out loud at Billy Cos Bill Cosby when he was down um, in Springfield, just laughing out loud, couldn't control She was embarrassed. She was laughing so loud, enjoying it. So I'm watching. This one's crying. This one's laughing, and I'm sitting there. I don't know what's happening here. I, I don't get it. And I was a little bit offended by it because she was so proudly atheist, which is fine. You can be proudly atheist, but she really had no respect for this, what we're doing now. She, had no, she almost thought it was like silly and naive and maybe even a little bit stupid to believe in God. And so I, I was sitting there rather offended by the whole program. But that's the world out there, and we have to disbelieve what they believe. We have to really count this as, as sacred, as you are doing right now on a hot, miserable Sunday like this to be here, because this is important. And so we have to do that on faith. You know, Paul had that exceptional reading um, where he talks about 14 years ago, a man, he's not even saying himself, but a man, I know a man who went up to heaven. I don't know if it was in the body. He can't put it into words, but he had this experience of God. And he had this rapture moment where he went up to heaven and now he knows for sure. But he can't put it into words. And you know, for the rest of us who don't have that experience, we have to do it on faith. I went away to that, that family wedding. A cousin of mine, we're sitting on the bus going to the, to the family wedding from the hotel. You take a bus so that you can come home without worrying about how to get home. So we're on the bus going to the wedding and he tells me about his near-death experience. This guy is not at all worried about death because he died and came back. And he knows that when you die, there is something more. So he doesn't have to rely just on faith. He knows what Paul is talking about. He knows that when this physical body goes to rest, there's something else waiting for us. But if we don't have that experience, it's based on faith. And it means don't stop disbelieving when everyone else says, you really go to church on Sunday? You really believe that stuff in the Bible? You go to Bible class on Tuesday at 7 p.m., send Randy the login, or send Randy an email, I'll send you the login. If you really believe that stuff, we have to stop disbelieving. And we have to believe that there's a mystery taking place here in the simplicity and splendor of this table that brings us into communion with God. We have to stop disbelieving. And so it worked for the Celtics, it worked for Jason Tatum, and I hope it works for us as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
And our communion hymn today is Let Us Break Bread Together, Red Hymnal number 288. in your bulletins. This table is for all people who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's people. The Gospel tells us that on the first day of the week, Jesus was raised from death, appeared to Mary Magdalene, on that same day sat at the table with two disciples and was made known to them in the breaking of bread. This is a joyful feast of the people of God. Women, men, youth, and children, wherever you are, gather around. For this table is for all people who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's people. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God the Most High. We give you thanks, God of majesty and mercy, for the beauty and the bounty of the earth and for the vision of the day when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We rejoice that you call the entire human family to this table of sacrifice and love. We come in remembrance and celebration of the gift of Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be the good news. Born of Mary, our sister in faith, Christ lived among us to reveal the light and life of your grace, to suffer on the cross for us, to be raised from death, and then to live in glory. We bless you, gracious God, for the presence of your Holy Spirit in the church among us. And with your daughters and sons of faith, in all times, all places, we praise you with joy by saying, Holy, holy, holy God of love and majesty, a holy universe speaks of your glory. O God, most high. blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God, Hosanna in the highest. We remember that on the night of his betrayal and desertion, that Jesus took bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Christ's name, I share with you the bread. In the same way, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ's name, I share with you the cup. And may we now share in the prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of our Savior's presence in the simplicity and splendor of this holy meal. Unite us with all who are fed by Christ's body and blood, that we may faithfully proclaim the good news of your love, and that your universal church may be a rainbow of hope in an uncertain world. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, amen. And as is our custom on a communion Sunday, the next hymn is in your bulletin. It is Shalom to you now.
thank you again for coming out today. I know it's uncomfortable. Um, my ice vest helped a lot, but you're just out there hot. Um, so um, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And, and I think it's going to be like this for most of the week. So try to stay cool and think about those people that have to work out in this and maybe say a little prayer for them as well. Um, as Irene mentioned, if anybody wants to come to Bible study, we are at the very beginning. We spent an hour talking about Genesis chapter 1. Uh, we might do an hour on Genesis chapter 2 and 3 this coming week, and then it's going to move a little bit faster. But uh, there's a lot in there that is not like a Sunday school lesson. Uh, so if you'd like to uh, maybe try to dive in a little bit deeper into the Bible, uh, just drop me an email or a call, and I'll send you the Zoom login for Tuesday evening. So let us share in our benediction as we begin to go our separate ways. In the name of the Nazareth carpenter, who often went unrecognized among those who saw him day in and day out, let us emulate his deeds of compassion and power. Let us see the glory in them. In humility, let us reach out to help and also to be helped. Let our time together help us to see Jesus more clearly so that we can help others recognize him in their hearts and also out in our world. God's steadfast love, it surrounds us wherever we go, not only in this sanctuary. May our faith guide us today and always to be able to see that. And as disciples of Christ, we are Jesus' hands, his feet, and his voice in the world. So with that in mind, let us now go forth to love and serve the Lord in all that we do among all whom we may meet. Amen.
Thank you.